All right, guys, today we're going to talk about the amendment to address concerns. And this form, while it is very simple looking at it, uh, can be quite the devil. Um, so we're going to take a closer look at it. And I encourage you guys to pay close attention to this because uh, there's a there's a lot in this very short little form. So this is an amendment. So we're going to have our amendment number here. And keep in mind that uh, uh, there's never going to be a skip in amendment numbers. So there's going to be an amendment one, amendment two, amendment three. If there is an amendment five, there needs to be a one, two, three, and four. Okay. So if this is the first amendment to the contract, which it usually is, it's going to be amendment number one. Uh, sometimes it will be amendment number two because we did an amendment to extend the due diligence period. All right. The other thing to keep in mind about the amendment number is the, the number is only used once both parties agree to it. So if the buyer sends over an amendment to address concerns, the seller doesn't like it and they counter offer with an alternative amendment to address concerns, that's still going to be amendment number one. The buyer's not happy with that. They counter back and they send it over. That is still amendment number one. And you will continue to be on amendment number one until everybody has signed a, a version of that amendment. And then we'll have amendment number two. Okay. And you cannot have two amendment number ones. You can't have two amendment number twos. Uh, amendments are numbered because the order is important. So amendment number, the date we are proposing the amendment. Uh, the undersigned parties have entered into the agreement between the buyer's name and the seller's name with a binding agreement date of and whatever date that contract went binding for the purchase and sale of real property at. And we have our address, city and zip code. And there's only two places for us to fill anything in here. We have either that if this is agreed to, the due diligence period shall or it shall not terminate. Okay. And, and to understand what that means is uh, imagine that you are a buyer and you're sending over uh, a list of repairs, which is what's typically going to be on here or, or changes to the contract. Shall means that if you agree to do these things, okay, our due diligence shall end. We're not going to ask for anything else. We're not going to do any more inspections. We're done. We're, we're ready to head to the closing table. Okay. Whereas if you mark shall not, essentially what you're saying is, Hey seller, we want you to do all of this stuff. We, we want you to agree to that today, but we may come back in the future and ask for some more stuff to be done, or we might change our mind and terminate the contract. So shall is always a more powerful option um, than shall not, uh, but shall not does have a place. Uh, and that's the reason that it's there. Uh, a good example of when you would use shall not, you went out, you did your, your typical home inspection, uh, the roof was an issue and we're not moving forward if we can't get agreement on the roof. Okay. But I haven't inspected the pool yet, or we haven't inspected the well yet. And before I spend money to have someone come out and inspect the pool or have somebody come out and inspect the well, uh, we, we want to get agreement on the roof because there's no reason for me to spend my client's money on those other inspections. Uh, if, if we're not going to be able to come to an agreement around the roof. Okay. So most of the time we're going to be marking shall, uh, in the rare occasion that we need an agreement before we go spend money on additional inspections. Um, that that's the only time we're going to use shall not. Then we get down here and we have the following language is pro provided by both parties. Okay. Um, now in this space, there's some rules that I need you to follow. Okay. Number one, don't ever reference the inspection report. 
Okay. Whenever you reference the inspection report, the inspection report becomes a part of the contract by reference. And that means that the lender is going to want to see it. And, and whether you're on the buyer side or the seller side, you, you don't want the lender having to look at the inspection report. Your buyer may have no issue with, with a certain condition at the property, uh, either because uh, it, it's just not a big concern of theirs, or even if it is a concern, uh, they have a connection. They have a friend, a family member, a relative, uh, someone that, that they, they're going to have do the work after the transaction. Okay. But the lender may take an issue with it. And, and so we don't ever want to put in front of the lender, here are potential property problems with the property uh, and make them um, decide that they're going to terminate uh, or, or not finance the loan because of some other issue with the property. Okay. So what we want to put in here, what we do want is who, what, and when. Okay. So if, if we're asking for repairs, we're asking for who's going to do the repair. Okay. Is the seller doing the repair? Is a licensed contractor? Is a licensed plumber, licensed HVAC contractor um, going to be doing the repair? And what repair are they going to do? Okay. And, and we need to be very specific with our language. Uh, talk like a fifth grader. Put it in language that anyone could read this. And, and we put this in front of a judge. We put this in front of a jury of 12 people. Everybody's going to read it and come to the same conclusion. You know, a, a great example would be if you were to put in here, uh, seller to, uh, replace all damaged siding. Okay. Well, you, you put that in front of a, a, a jury and you have a piece of siding that on that piece of siding, it's got a little nick in the siding, you know, like that. Is that siding damaged? Well, yeah. And somebody may decide that that piece of siding should have been replaced. Okay. Um, and somebody else may not have. So that that's kind of an ambiguous request. So we want to be very specific, you know, seller to replace bottom two rows of siding on the rear of the house. Okay. A uh, couple of other things in here. Uh, so that would be the who, that would be the what. So we're going to list everything that we want done, you know, seller to high licensed plumber to replace the water heater, uh, so to have a licensed electrician, remove double taps uh, from the breaker box, uh, seller to uh, have gutters cleaned. Um, we're we're going to create our list of whatever it is that, that's a priority to our client. And, and then I encourage you to add the language, uh, seller to have all work completed no later than five days prior to closing. Okay. Now, repairs aren't the only thing that can go on here. We can also, um, in, instead of repairs, uh, we can ask for a change in the sales price. We can ask for an increase in seller's contributions to closing. But again, our, our language here is really important. I would not want to put in here uh, sales prices reduced by $2,000 in lieu of repairs. Two problems with that statement. One, I don't want to talk about what things were or how they've changed. The language we put in here would be replacing what's in the contract. So if the sales price was $300,000, all I need to put on this document is sales price is $298,000 period. Okay. So don't, don't talk about what it was. Don't talk about what it's changed from or how much it's changed. Just state what, what it is right now. And don't ever use the phrase in lieu of repairs. Again, this document needs to be uh, shared with the lender. And when the lender sees the phrase in lieu of repairs, uh, what do you think their natural question is going to be? What repairs? Okay. They want to, they want to know that that means there's an issue with the property. Maybe they shouldn't be making a loan to that property. 
Okay. A uh, couple other things to uh, to keep in mind with this. Um, the more we ask for, the less competitive our offer is going to be. The less we ask for, the more competitive um, our, our, our greater likelihood we're going to get the seller to accept it. We are in a seller's market right now, uh, so sellers are less inclined. The, the idea here is that our inspection report was not a shopping list. Um, we're not looking that everything be fixed. Uh, odds are you're, you're writing this amendment to address concerns for a non new property. Okay. When a property is not new, we do not expect it to be in perfect condition. Okay. We, we saw the condition the property was in when we visited the property. We saw the condition that was in, uh, before we made our offer, okay, that that seller has priced that property and we made our offer based on uh, the condition of the property as is, okay. Uh, if there was something that we knew before we made the offer that, that we were going to need to have changed or addressed um, in order for us to be comfortable moving forward, we, we needed to ask for that with our original contract. The, the purpose of the amendment to address concerns is to address things that were hidden, things that were not obvious to us, things that were not disclosed by the seller uh, prior to us uh, uh, doing the inspection, uh, thing, things we didn't know. Uh, so we find out that there's a roofing issue. The, the water heater is at the end of its life. The AC system's not functioning properly. There's a, a link under a leak under a sink. There's um, outlets in the house that don't work. Okay. Those weren't obvious. We needed the inspection to identify those. And, and then we need to make a judgment. Is this an issue that as a buyer, I'm not going to buy the house if this isn't fixed, you know, just because there's not a GFCI outlet in the bathroom, am I going to let that $20 repair uh, keep me from buying this $400,000 house? You know, that, that shouldn't be the expectation. You know, the expectation is that the buyer should uh, take responsibility for some of the things in the house. Um, but every buyer is going to be different. So you really need to coach them through this process. Okay. The other thing that you need to know about the amendment to address concerns is when does this have to be completed? Okay. Has to be completed during due diligence. I want you guys to read this statement right here. This amendment is intended to set forth the agreement of the parties relative to concerns raised by the buyer during the due diligence period. If this amendment does not become effective, meaning signed by both sides during the due diligence period, it shall become null and void and of no legal force and effect. So if this document signed after the end of due diligence, it, it's completely meaningless. It is not part of the contract. Um, it, it, it bears no legal weight, has no teeth, it's not enforceable. Okay. This has to be done before the end of due diligence. That, that doesn't mean that you can't do an amendment afterwards and address or repair after that. But during due diligence is when we have the most influence uh, as a buyer. Uh, we're, we're asking the seller to please make these repairs or we're going to take our earnest money and we're going to leave. Okay. After the end of due diligence, when we don't have a right to terminate, the, the only leverage we have is if you don't make these repairs, we're going to give you our earnest money and we're going to leave. Okay. The threat of taking the earnest money away and leaving the transaction is a much more powerful motivator for a seller uh, to be inclined to agree to something that's in here. Okay. The, the fact that this needs to be done before the end of due diligence period also puts us on a clock. Okay. That's the reason we want to ask for seven days of due diligence, ask for 10 days of due diligence. We need enough time to have our inspection done and then to negotiate this particular document and whatever changes those are going to be either repairs or changes to the contract uh, with the, the price, the seller's contributions to closing, the seller's date, some other concession that was given. 
Uh, all of that's on the table to be negotiated here, but it has to be done before due diligence. And understand that us sending this document to a seller is not sufficient. They have to accept it. They have to sign it and send it back to us before the end of due diligence. So if we find ourselves coming up to the end of due diligence and we do not have this negotiated, OK, we only have a couple of options. Uh, one, we can go ahead and terminate the contract and preserve our client's earnest money. OK, because we can terminate for any reason during due diligence or we get the other side to agree to extend the due diligence and give us more time. We, we went out and we did our inspection. We found some things were wrong with the property, but the inspector recommended that we do some additional inspections. OK, there, there's an issue that they're concerned about and we need to get a roofing professional out there. We need to get a, um, 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 a plumber out there. We need to get an electrician. We need to get quotes on some of the work for us to find out. Are we willing to accept the responsibility for it as the buyer? Uh, or are we going to be asking the seller to make it? And if we're making an adjustment to the sales price uh, or the seller's contribution to closing, what, what price is going to make sense? So we need more time for those additional inspections. We always have the option of extending due diligence if both parties agree. OK, but we need to get that signed prior to due diligence ending. Uh, the last option that we have. There is a special stipulation written for us uh, in the GAR special stipulations. It's special stipulation number 302. OK, and that particular special stipulation, it's amendment to address concerns as notice to terminate. OK, and, and paraphrasing what's in that um, special stipulation, it says that if we don't agree to this amendment to address concerns, or a future amendment to address concerns, uh, then this is our notice that at the end of our due diligence, we're terminating. OK, what that allows is um, you're not sitting up at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, the last day of due diligence, waiting and hoping that the other side's going to send back a signed copy and then trying to at the very last hour terminate the agreement with your client. What that says is putting that special stipulation in allows you to go to bed at a comfortable time, your buyer to go to bed at a comfortable time, knowing that if the other side sends it back, we're good. We've got agreement. We're, we're moving forward or at midnight, our, our contract is going to terminate. My client's earnest money is protected um, and, and the contract is dead. And we're going to either need to write a new contract on the same property. OK, because once a contract is terminated, it can't be revived or it's time for us to go find another property. OK. Um, as I was saying, very simple agreement. Not much on here. Big blank space. And then our signatures at the bottom. OK, um, but. There's a lot to take into consideration with the amendment. Um, if you need help with the language, um, if you need somebody to review it before you send it, uh, certainly send it to me. Uh, I'm glad to take a look at it and give you some feedback. A uh, couple other little tips. Uh, there is no need to put in here. All parties agree. OK, all parties agree that the following blah, blah, blah. Both sides signed it. They already agree. So, so no need to say that in there. Uh, the, the second thing, uh, don't ask the seller to do your inspections for you. OK, the purpose of the due diligence period is for the buyer to do whatever inspections they need to do to be comfortable moving forward. So in here, asking the seller to have a roofing contractor come out and respect the inspect the roof and do whatever repairs are necessary or asking the seller to uh, have the septic tank inspected or have a plumber come and inspect something that that's not what the seller needs to do. OK, the, the seller's obligation is not to do the inspections for the buyer. The purpose of this 
is the buyers telling the seller, this is what you need to do for me to be comfortable moving forward. This is the work that needs to be done. This is the change. Okay. The due diligence period is the time period for the buyer to do their inspections. And guys, with that being said, uh, we're 20 minutes in on, on what looks like a super simple form. Uh, I hope you guys appreciate and understand uh, that the, the reason I say this can be the devil, okay? This is the most difficult form to get right because we are having to provide everything that goes in this. Um, it's not just little blanks that we're filling in. Uh, so again, if you need help, call me, text me, email me, and uh, have an awesome day.